Um, if you've got a Bible today, you can turn it to the book of Ephesians. That's where we're going to be at, Ephesians, or turn it on to the book of Ephesians uh, as it is 2024. And many of us don't even read physical Bibles, read digital Bibles. Um, well, once again, happy Father's Day to all the dads. Super pumped that you would join us today. Um, some of you are dads of people who attend here. Some of you attend here and are dads. Whatever the case is, we are honored that you are here. And um, being a dad is an amazing thing. Um, it's not easy, but it is definitely worth it and it's awesome. And I uh, wouldn't trade it for the world. In order to be a good dad, here's one thing that you have to know, is you have to know that you are loved. If you want to be a good dad, you have to know that you are loved. Before you can give love, you have to receive it. And in order to be the kind of dad we want to be, I think we need to have the love of a father in our lives. It's unfortunate because in our world today, in our country, we're kind of dealing with a fatherless epidemic. 20 million children live without a dad physically present in the home. And that equates to about one in four kids in America. So almost 25% of our kids are living without a dad physically present, but then there's dads that are physically present but are maybe not emotionally present or maybe distant in other ways. And it's such a critical role in a child's life. A father's involvement, studies have shown, is just as important to a child's development as a mother's. In fact, stu some studies show that a father's involvement is even more significant to the child's development. You may have heard these kinds of stats before, but I think they're, they're worth repeating because it helps enforce the importance of this the positive effects of a dad being around are gigantic. 75% of people who have a dad in the home are less likely to have a teen birth. 80% are less likely to spend time in jail. And half as likely to experience multiple depression symptoms. Children who feel closest to their father are twice as likely to enter college. And in a 26-year-long study, researchers found that the number one factor in developing empathy in children was a father's involvement. Fathers spending regular time with their children translated into children who became compassionate adults. But when a dad isn't there, the results are also devastating. 71% of all high school dropouts come from father-absent homes. 90% of homeless and runaway children, 63% of youth suicides. The importance of the role of a dad can't be overstated. And the hole that's left by not having a dad is very hard to fill. But in order to be a good dad, you need a good dad. And yet we live in a culture where lots of dads aren't around or they aren't really good examples. And so what's the solution? What are we supposed to do? Well, I've called today's message, Dads Need Dads. Dads Need Dads. And my goal in today's message is not to make anybody feel guilty. Uh, if you're a dad and you're at church today, you're awesome. Like, kudos to you. If you've made the decision on Father's Day that instead of doing other things that you could go do, like be on the lake or like go camping or whatever, you're like, hey, I wanted to be at church with my kids. That's amazing. You're setting a spiritual example for your home and bravo to you. And my goal today is not to pile on any sense of condemnation or like you're not doing enough because I feel like dads actually receive that message quite often and guilt does nothing to help improve the situation. I don't think that that is the answer. And so today, I don't want to discourage you. I actually want to try to encourage you because dads are dealing with a lot. Like, I actually read a study that said that dads feel more judged in their parenting by their spouse than the other way around. 
And so dads are already dealing mentally with a barrage of negative emotions or feeling like they might not be living up to the standard that they should be, but guilt is never going to change anything. But what can change something is love. And today I want us to look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. Because before we get started on thinking about what a dad can be, we need to understand what a dad already is, which is a child. Every parent is a child. And every child of God already has a secure identity that they just need to understand and start to live in. Ephesians chapter five, verse one, it says this. It says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Listen, in order to be a good dad, you have to start with knowing that you're a loved child. I'll say it again. In order to be a good dad, you have to start with knowing that you're a loved child. What does this verse say? Imitate God as dearly loved or beloved children. So my dads in the room who are following Jesus, I just want you to be affirmed in who you are, that you are loved. You're a dearly loved child of God. And so you don't need to go out and become something. You need to already realize who you are. You are a loved child of God. Before you can give love, you have to receive it. 1 John 4, 19, it says, we love because he first loved us. Can I just encourage you this morning that Wherever you're at, whoever you are, whether you realize it or not, whether you believe it or not, you are loved. You are loved. We say that at church a lot. You are loved. We end our services sometimes. You are loved. And that's a really nice thing to say. But it's a life-transforming thing to believe. And if you can get a hold of that and actually apply it to your life, whoo, watch out. Listen, you aren't just loved and I know this is kind of a message targeted at dads, but I think it affects all of us. You are loved in the most incredible way. The kind of love that God has for us is called agape love. The Bible has different words in the original language that it uses for love, and they all mean different things. There's a, a, a brotherly love. There's a friendship kind of a love. There's a romantic love. And one, there's a great book called The Four Loves by C.S. Lewis if you want to dig deep into this. But the word in the Greek for the kind of love that God gives us is the word agape. Agape. And what makes God's love distinct from every other kind of love it is, that, is that it is a 100% unconditional type of love. So all of the love that we share between humans, as great as it is, still has a little bit of condition in it. If somebody doesn't rise up to the standard that you're hoping they will, there is a disparity in your love towards them. But God's love isn't like that. God's love is constant. God's love is eternal. God's love never changes. God's love is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's love is permanent. It won't move, and it is secure. It is agape, 100% unconditional kind of love. It's like God's love is a waterfall, and it's coming off the side of a mountain, and it's just continually pouring over the edge of this cliff. And we have the ability to step in and experience this waterfall or to stay back and just look at it and admire it. But the water is gonna continue to pour down the side of the mountain. God's love is like that. It's always there. It's the same all the time. And you have the choice to step into it and receive it and experience it or just look at it and admire it from a distance and not understand how it can change your life. But you can at any point walk into God's constant love because it never changes. 
It's a rock, it's a bedrock for us. Listen, God loves you just as much on your best day as he does on your worst day. God loves you just as much today as he did yesterday. And he loves you just as much tomorrow as he does today. His love is always the same. And so, we don't have to earn this love. We just have to receive it. Because you can't do anything to earn this love. Like, all of us make mistakes. All of us have messed up. All of us have done things that you would think would cause God to maybe shift in his opinion about us. But yet he says, I love you the same. Always. The closest kind of love that we could experience, I think, to this type of love on earth is, is kind of like the love that a parent has for a child. Because your kid, you know, you could make a case that they do a lot of things to make it harder for you to love them. And even when they're young, you know, like, they aren't really doing anything. Like, they're, they're just, they're like making you get up at night, they're crying, they're wanting things from you, they need you constantly. But none of that makes you not love them. You, you still love them just as much, if not more. Now, it's not an equal comparison because even as parents, our love can fluctuate. And our kids can do things that upset us or hurt us and we don't demonstrate the kind of love towards them in every moment that we should. So God's love is even greater than the love of a parent, even though that's something to kind of give us a clue as to what God's love is like. So listen, your identity is secure, that you are loved. One of the best ways I think to understand this is to look at Jesus. Because Jesus is God's son. Yes, he is also God, but he is also God's son. And so Jesus existed in eternity as the son of God. God the Father is called God the Father, not just because he is the creator of humanity, but because he's always been a father to a son. This is like, by the way, if you're interested in the, the Trinity and what the Bible has to say about that, this is why the Trinity is so foundational and important because it helps us understand what love is. Because the Bible tells us that God is love, but if God is like, if there was nobody for him to pour his love out on to, then how could he be love? Like prior to humanity, how could he have been love? Only inside the Trinity. He was loving the Son and the Spirit, and they were loving each other. Otherwise, it's this weird, like, love of self. Like, God's like, well, I just love myself. I just love myself so much. But out of that love between the Father, the Son, the Spirit, they created humanity, which also shows us that God doesn't need anything from us. It was out of the abundance of the love he already had within himself that he created us to experience that love. And so God says, I love you. And his love is constant. And Jesus has received that love forever. And then when Jesus was on earth doing his ministry, he got baptized. And God the Father speaks from heaven in Matthew 3, 17. And he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Jesus shows us what it's like to be 100% secure in the love of a father. Because Jesus, prior to this moment, had done no miracles, had preached no messages, had done no ministry. He was just his father's son. And God looks at him before all the magnificent things that he would do that we read about in scripture. And before he does one of them, he says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And that's what you need to know this morning, is that when God looks at you through Christ, he says the same thing about you. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Before you get your act together, before you figure out everything that's supposed to happen in your life, before you change and become the better version of yourself that God wants you to be, before that, he says, this is my son. This is my daughter in whom I am well pleased. You have to understand your identity. 
Because so many of us were trying to parent to earn God's approval. Oh man, if I could just be a better parent, I bet God would be a little bit happier. But you'll never be a better parent until you understand that you're unconditionally loved. And then you can start to unconditionally love your kids. And then you can unconditionally love your spouse. And you can unconditionally love the people around you because what does Ephesians 5.1 tell us? It says, be imitators of God as dearly loved children. So here's your identity. I'm a dearly loved child. That's who I am. That's just what God has said about me. I am a dearly loved child. And now my role is not to do. My role is to follow. Be imitators of God. Your role, Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 in the message translation, it says it like this. I didn't say this in the first service. This is just for the second service. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 in the message. Watch God, watch what God does, and then you do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. So God says, look at me and watch what I do. And then you do it. God leads by example. And so our role is just to receive his love. And then as we experience his love, it gives us a basis from which to be able to love other people. Because we see the type of love that God gives us. For example, I was thinking about how good dads, they provide for their kids. And God is like that with us. He provides for us. Like everything that we need, he's there for us. In Ephesians chapter five, or chapter one, verse three, it says that we have every spiritual blessing in Christ. So when God gave us this new birth in Jesus, he, also, he didn't just like give us the new birth and like a child in a hospital gets their umbilical cord cut and then they just are put in that little, uh, you know, whatever thing that they hold the kids in. What's that called? The, um, the what? The bassinet, thank you. They get put in the bassinet and then the parents are like, sweet, figure it out. I'm sure you got it from here. No, like God didn't just like give us new birth and then leave us on our own. He gave us every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. So he's like, I'm not just gonna provide for you to be alive. I'm gonna provide for you to live the way I want you to live. And so as a good father, he's provided for us. So what do we take from that as imitators of God is that as dads and parents, we provide for our children. We think ahead. We anticipate their needs. And we understand what it's going to take to help them get to where they need to go. And good parents think ahead and provide for their children's needs. But it's not to earn anything from God. It's because I've received that kind of love from him. And it's natural for me to extend that love to my kids and extend that love to my friends and extend that love to my spouse. We're just imitators. Think about all the ways that God is a good father to us. He gives us wisdom through his word. He, he guides us. He corrects us when we need correction. He listens to us. He's patient with us. What are like amazing attributes for parents to have with their kids. We are to be imitators of our Father who is in heaven. So, God doesn't just say it, he shows it. Dads need dads, and we ultimately need our heavenly Father, but we also need other dads. And for many of us, I talked about how we've grown up or been around in a fatherless epidemic, and so like we're faced with this challenge of trying to be parents when maybe we didn't have the best parents or we didn't have any dad in the house. How are we supposed to do this? What I think is you need to get in proximity to somebody who can be an example to you. So much of our spiritual maturity 
is just getting around people that are a little bit further along and learning from them and asking questions and being around them. And so spiritual maturity comes as we have examples in our life. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. So this is like in tandem with Ephesians. Be imitators of your Father in heaven. So Paul's saying, I'm going to imitate Christ. And as I imitate him, imitate me. Fake it till you make it. Find somebody that you can imitate. Like, that's actually a good rule of thumb in anything. Like, you want to get good at music? Find somebody you can imitate until you get your own voice and you get your own sound. You want to be good at preaching? Find somebody that you can imitate until you become who you are. But you have to start by imitating somebody else. And so if you want to grow in your walk with Christ, you want to grow in being a good dad, get around dads that are good dads. Get in a dinner party with some parents who love Jesus and watch how they parent their kids. And it doesn't always have to be like, here, sit down and let me teach you the five rules of parenting that I learned. <laughs> just sometimes just being around. Just, just getting around others. And, and I said this in the first service. You should find people that, you can, that can help you grow spiritually. But you don't always have to find one person who can do everything. Like, hey, teach me how to be a good dad. Teach me how to be a good husband. Teach me how to do good with my finances. Teach me how to follow Christ. Teach me how to start a business. Maybe, maybe one person isn't great at all those things. But maybe you can find four people who are great at those different things. And you can get around them and intentionally ask them questions and learn from them in the areas that they're good in and try to become who you need to be with a collection of people around you. I heard a pastor call that like your, your bullpen. You gotta have a good bullpen of people to draw from. And so dads need dads. One thing I think is interesting is that you can be a good dad without having a good dad. And I don't know what your situation is. Like maybe you had a great upbringing, you love your parents, they're, they're the examples that you're following. And maybe for others, you had a rough relationship with your parents and you weren't raised in a godly home and even besides it not being godly, it just wasn't a strong home. Or maybe some of us, myself, didn't grow up with a dad for various reasons. My dad died when I was really young. So whatever the case is, I just want you to know God will give you what you need to be the kind of parent and person that he wants you to become. And a lot of times he gives you what you need through the church, through other people that are gonna help you and, and encourage you and come alongside you. But even for me, I, I was encouraged because I had this thought about two years ago, and Joseph, Jesus' earthly dad, after Jesus' adolescence, we don't really hear anything about Joseph. So there's a story where Jesus is like 12 and he's going to the temple. That's the last time we hear about Joseph. And most scholars think that Joseph died. And I had this thought. I was like, Jesus knows what it's like to not have an earthly dad. Or to lose a dad. And there's some of us in this room that have lost our parents that we love dearly. Joseph was a good dad. But Jesus didn't have him. And yet, Jesus still had a heavenly father. And he had what he needed to become who God wanted him to be. And so, I grew up without a dad. But God has been faithful to be a father to me. The scripture says in the Psalms that God is a father to the fatherless. God comes alongside in a special way with those situations in homes where there's not a dad around. And he's able to fill in the gap more than adequately. And also I've had great people in my life that have been good examples to me. Like my father-in-law and others that God has surrounded me with at different times to encourage me. And so listen, 
Jesus can relate to know what it's like to not have a dad. And God can become your father in an even closer way. And God can also break off the chain of the bad example and the generational sin that you've experienced in your home. It might not be easy, because I'll be frank with you, it's probably easier to have no example than it is to have a bad example. Because a bad example is a lot harder to undo than no example at all. And it might take time and effort and work to get into your soul and to undo or change the things that need to be changed based on the upbringing that you've had. I'm not gonna try to belittle that or minimize that. But I will tell you that with Jesus, it's possible. It's possible because Romans 8, 15, it says it like this. It says, you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The reason that it can be different for you is because God's adopted you into his family. And he's changed your primary identity. The greatest and deepest identity in your life is that you are a child of God. And so because of that, you are no longer a slave to fear. You are no longer a slave to your past. You are no longer a slave to the upbringing that you had, but you have been radically transformed on the inside and received adoption into the family of God that can break off all of the generational stuff that's happened in the past because you have been grafted into a new family tree. And you have a new beginning and a new start. And it all begins with God speaking over your life, you are loved. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. That's who you are. Yes, you've had failures. Yes, you've had mistakes. Yes, you've maybe messed some things up royally, but you are loved. And there's nothing you can do to change that love that God has for you. And when you start to believe and receive that identity in Christ that you are loved, that's the basis from which everything else can change. The Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. Fear drives us to do so many things that damage us. I watched a movie last night called Inside Out 2. Really biblical-based movie. I think it was uh, mostly from 1 John that they were drawing inspiration from. But all joking aside, I won't, I won't spoil the movie, but there was actually quite a bit in it that relates to what the scripture does say. And what I pulled from it was just that if you wanna change, it starts with love. Dads need dads. If you wanna be a good dad, you gotta have a good dad. And if you're a follower of Jesus, you've got the best dad. You've got the best example to follow. You've got the best person to mold your life after. And so what if we could rise up into who God's called us to be and we could be a church, not of perfect parents, but of good parents who love their kids, who discipline their kids, but also encourage their kids, who support their kids, who are examples of what God has been an example to for us. I just want you to know this morning, if you don't take away anything else from this message, that you are loved.
and that's never going to change. And there's a lot of us that we're not secure in that, and so we're insecure in a lot of other areas. But when you can really build the foundation and the DNA of your life on the fact that you're a loved child of the King, then you can be secure enough to build things on the rest of that foundation. So I want to close today with just, I, I feel like this message is kind of slightly intense because we're talking about some really serious stuff here, like fathers and dads, and this, this stuff goes deep. And I don't even have all the answers, but I just know that God does. And that he can make us into who he wants us to be. Can we pray together as we close today? Lord, I just pray over our church and over those hearing this message who maybe are hurting or grieving, maybe they've lost a father. Oh, Lord, I just pray that you would come close to them and show them that you are a father and that they would experience that in a deeper way than they've ever experienced it before. Lord, I pray for those that have very serious wounds from their parents, from their dads. And Lord, I, I know that you grieve over those things. I know that, that your heart breaks over wrongs that have been done and you don't condone or endorse any of that. But Lord, I thank you also that you give us a new beginning. You give us a fresh start. You give us a clean slate. You, you give us a way to be healed from past pain. And so, Lord, I just pray over anyone today who needs healing in their life from father wounds, that they would experience you as the best father that they would know it is possible to be a good parent. It is possible to have a good father. Lord, for those of us that are just trying to be the moms and the dads that you want us to be, Lord, help us follow your example. understand 
maybe things that even need to happen moving forward for them to really be healed and whole. Lord, I just pray that you would replace the identity that was spoken over them that was negative with the identity of who they are in you as a child of God. They're not a mistake. They're not a failure. They're not a screw up. They are your beloved child. And Lord, I pray you would break off every negative thing that has been said and we rebuke the words of the enemy over their lives and in their thoughts that try to keep them down and try to tell them that they'll never amount to anything or they can't move forward. Lord, we rebuke those. And Lord, parents, those of us that are parents in this room, if we have spoken negative words over our children, we rebuke that. Those things should not be said. Lord, help us to have your spirit to guide our mouths and our tongues and to speak life, speak life over our kids, speak life over our friends and our spouses. Oh, Lord, thank you that you are a good father, a good father who protects us, a good father who rebukes the enemy, who is a shepherd who keeps the wolves away. Lord, we just speak against the wolves they would have no place in the lives of people here and in the lives in the life of our church. Thank you, God. We love you and we pray this in Jesus.